What is, in my opinion of course, the greatest chord sequence by a British band from the 1990s? You probably all think I'm going to say the Master Plan by Oasis or something like that, but I'm not. There are some great contenders for the number one slot. The Manic Street Preachers came up with some unbelievably complicated avant-garde chord sequences. Miss Shapes by Pulp is another very strong contender. Suicide Drive by the Seahorses is also right up there for me. The song that tops the list for me, however, was recorded at the Coach House in Rockfield Studios, produced by Owen Morris, the album art was by Brian Cannon, and I'm still not talking about Oasis. I'm talking about a tune called Goldfinger by three Northern Irish lads who were, incredibly, teenagers at the time. This is Ash, who were then a teenage three-piece rock outfit whose debut album contained some of the best tracks of the Britpop era. Goldfinger was their breakout single. It placed them in the top five in the UK at the height of Britpop mania in April 96 and helped push their album, 1977, right the way up the album charts to number one. And, interestingly, this song, which I consider to be their masterpiece, never would have even been on the album at all had it not been for Owen Morris. In an interview, frontman and songwriter Tim Wheeler said this. In December 95, Owen came over to Northern Ireland to stay for a few days and run through any ideas we had. I played through everything I thought was good, but he wasn't too excited by anything. So finally, I went, all right, this is the last idea I have, and it was Goldfinger. It's a bit weird and probably would be nothing more than an interesting B-side. I played my weird little verse and chorus, and all of a sudden, he got really excited. It was the one he'd been looking for. According to Tim, they called it Goldfinger because the chord sequence in the instrumental section reminded them of that song, that James Bond theme, by John Barry. Apparently, Tim had a hard time coming up with song titles, so they just called it that, Goldfinger. At the time of its release in 1996, Tim said, Goldfinger is the best song we've ever written, and the best words I've ever written. And the words are great, but today I want to look at the chord sequence. Back in the 90s, as a teenager myself, I was pretty good at working out chord sequences by ear, but this one was absolute bloody murder. Tim Wheeler was not using a capo, as I had assumed, but was using almost all bar chords from start to finish and changing key constantly in every section. The verse was in two different keys. There was a big key change for the chorus and a big key change for the instrumental section as well. And, as is so often the case with brilliant compositions by young teenage lads with a guitar, he probably had no idea. He probably just knocked it all together because it sounded right. So let's start with the verse. The first half is relatively unthreatening. It's in B flat, which is a bloody annoying key, but it's all diatonic. All the chords are nice and safe within the major key. Move closer, set my mind on fire. Move closer, set my mind on fire. We're in B flat major, and like I said, the first half of that verse is all just diatonic chords, so we've got no interesting beetly chords and no jarring nirvana chords. But now, let's look at the place I always hit a brick wall as a teenager, the second half of the first verse. Taking over, the world seems so alive, oh, oh, oh. the world seems so alive. So I love, oh, oh, oh. World 
Did you see what happened there? Tim Wheeler threw in two absolutely mental chords for this key, an E minor and an A7. And he managed to weave a vocal melody around them so smoothly that you barely even notice. Just to illustrate how out of place those two chords are, we're in B flat, so listen to B flat. And now listen to that with the E minor. That is a chord version of the tritone, which is one of the most discordant intervals in Western music. Now, of course, those two chords, E minor and A7, could be from several keys, but we know he moves into G from the notes he sings. Notes from the G E minor scale. And because the melody is so good there, that funny little turnaround that should be a jarring key change just actually functions kind of like a question mark in the music before we move straight back into the key of B flat. And now we come to the chorus and one of the coolest little tricks in the whole song. Tim is still playing a B flat but he adds one finger to that E shape to turn it into a B flat suspended fourth. So this is a key change trick. If you play these two chords anywhere on the neck, the ear naturally expects that you're going to resolve to the A shape in the same position. So let's try that a fret up. Works everywhere. But Tim Wheeler plays a trick on the ears with the notes he sings over these two chords. He sings E flat, B flat and F. He could at that point be in any key of several. And those notes combined with that chord act as a brilliant kind of pivot point, like a question mark, so you don't know what's coming next. But what comes next is once again really interesting, unpredictable and satisfying. You would expect him to resolve to an E-flat major like this. She slipped into the night. But he changes into a key you don't expect. Instead of changing into E-flat major, he changes into E-flat minor also known as G-flat major. And this creates even more tension and intrigue in the harmonic and melodic sound of this song. Interestingly, considering the title of the song, it's almost got James Bond theme levels of tension. So after that one bar where the key seems to pivot and balance on a seesaw so you don't know where it's going, Instead of moving to E-flat major, he moves to E-flat minor, also known as G-flat major. But he doesn't go into chord one or chord six. He goes a little more unexpectedly into chord two, A-flat minor. Most guitarists call this G-sharp minor. She slipped into the night and she was gone.
every line ends again with that brilliant pivot point. The B flat suspended fourth, back to a B flat. So we're back to a kind of implied E flat major just for the last chord of each time through the chorus sequence. And Tim uses that one bar of pivoting on the B flat suspended fourth at the end of the chorus to move smoothly back into the verse, another key change. Down in the basement, listening to the rain. And last of all, we come to the instrumental section that inspired the song's name. It's just a two chord movement between B flat and E flat minor, but we know from the lead part that Tim plays over the top of these chords that this is now actually in E flat harmonic minor. This is now the fifth key change of the song, but because Tim wrote it using sister keys and keys that have loads of notes in common and with this brilliant melody that just moves smoothly, weaving between them all, once again, you barely notice. And I think that's what I really love about this chord sequence. In the 1990s, some songwriters would just slap chords together Nirvana style, just like picking random chords on the basis of a dice roll with no reference whatsoever to musical theory. And while I love Nirvana and while I love that style, it can be a bit frigging abrasive after a while. I think it highly unlikely that Tim Wheeler knew all the little musical tips and tricks that he was using when putting together Goldfinger. I think he did it by accident, and that makes me love it all the more. I think he did approach the song in that kind of teenage garage band Nirvana style way of just slapping chords together, but his ear was so good, I think he accidentally used a ton of proper composer's tricks to move between keys in a way that's so smooth you barely even notice it when it happens. Do yourselves a favour, go listen to Goldfinger by Ash on Spotify or YouTube and then go buy a physical copy of their debut album 1977. Produced by Owen Morris, cover art by Brian Cannon, recorded at Rockfield Studios and number one in the UK in 1996. An absolute 100% genuine Britpop classic.